let's get started. Uh, I'm honoured to do this uh, role, but one particular great thing that I've been able to do at Congress is my two favourite books of the year. I've managed to get the authors to join us today because they're really, really relevant to what we are talking about, which is membership, which is worth owning, and conversations which are worth having. So before we start the panel, highly recommended read uh, Vulture Capitalism and the amazing author, if you can welcome to the stage, Grace Blakely. Thank you so much for that introduction, Rose. Um, so I was instructed to come here and provide something of a provocation um, for uh, the next couple of days. Um, so yeah, as Rose just mentioned, I'm going to be talking a bit about my book, Vulture Capitalism, um, and um, the relevance that I think it has, the arguments in the book have to uh, what we're doing here in the cooperative movement. So one of the main things that kind of inspired me to write the book was this sense that I've had kind of working in and around politics for quite some time, that one of the biggest emotions that is motivating people at the moment, whether in a, a positive or negative way, is a sense of powerlessness. A lot of people in our society feel very, very deeply and profoundly powerless. They feel as though decisions about their lives are being taken without much um, input from them, whether that's in their communities, whether it's kind of at a national level or whether it's in the workplace. Um, so many people feel like there are so many massive problems in the world and there is so little that they feel personally able to do to change it. And I think that a big part of the reason for that is that the way we think about economics and politics is a bit broken. Um, so in my book, I basically make the argument that free markets aren't really free, governments aren't really independent, and capitalism is actually a system based on pervasive central planning. The economy that we live in today is the legacy of the so-called free market turn that we had in the 1980s. We had politicians coming to power saying, the state's gotten too big, we need to shrink it, we need to create a, a space for free markets, and that's going to promote human freedom everywhere. It's going to give you all choices as consumers, and that's going to make your lives a lot better. But what was interesting about what happened in the 1980s is that the state really hasn't shrunk in most of the places that have, have implement, implemented this free market agenda. Instead, you've seen... Um, certain forms of state support, so for public services, for um, you know, welfare payments, generally the forms of support that benefit the vast majority of people, those have been cut. But if you look at subsidies for big businesses, banks and the wealthy, if you look at um, kind of behind the scenes support, so you know, implicit subsidies or you know, regulatory support, or indeed the kind of mass facilitation of tax avoidance and evasion that we've seen in recent years, the state has been very supportive of certain interests. For the wealthy and for big businesses and corporations, the state hasn't shrunk at all. And the market that we have today isn't free. It's dominated by these massive multinational corporations within which the average worker has very little power and that the average consumer has very little influence over. And even governments often struggle to influence if they even try, because half the time, you know, they're working alongside these corporations and have very similar aims. And I think this has resulted in a really significant confusion about what our economy is, what it does, and what the alternatives are. I saw this firsthand during the pandemic. So I was kind of going on TV and talking to all the talking heads about what was happening in the economy. And they kept asking me the same sorts of questions. They said, oh, Jeremy Corbyn lost the 2019 uh, general election, but he may as well have won because the government's doing loads of stuff. It's handing out all this money. We've basically got socialism. And there was this big idea during the pandemic that we'd have this thing called pandemic socialism because the government was spending loads of money. But if you look at where that government support was going, it wasn't supporting the average person. The vast majority of that money ended up flowing into the pockets of big businesses, financial institutions. Even the money that was distributed through the furlough scheme, 50% of it ended up in the pockets of banks or um, landlords because it ended up kind of flowing through to those payments. Um, and that money was really there to support the function of functioning of the economy rather than supporting ordinary people. And the legacy, legacy of the pandemic, as we saw, was an increase in inequality. Um, it was uh, booming profits for banks, fossil fuel companies, uh, supermarkets, a large number of other very powerful corporations. Um, and, you know, poverty, homelessness, worklessness for a lot of other people. 
the idea that that, that kind of sh created some sort of shift, it created a shift in the balance of power just because the government was spending more money, is obviously farcical. So we have this problem, which is that, you know, corporations aren't going to regulate themselves, but also we can't just rely on the idea that a, a big state is going to change things. The whole free market turn um, that was based on the idea that you would, you know, create these free markets that didn't end up being very free has actually just led us to a situation in which our lives are dominated by this kind of fusion of public and private power in service, basically, of the interests of those at the top. No wonder people feel so powerless. The example in the book that I use to illustrate this, some of you may be familiar with it, is the example of Boeing in the US. So you may have seen Boeing was in the news recently. The doors blew off some of its planes mid-flight. And this comes on the back of the 737 MAX disasters that took place in 2018 and 2019. Now, the 737 MAX disasters um, were basically the result of uh, a series of decisions made within Boeing. Um, that led to a massive corporate cover-up. They had built these massive planes, uh, and there was a problem with the design of them, and they tried to fix that using a software fix. Uh, senior engineers within the company knew that there were all sorts of problems with this plane. Senior managers, sorry. Various engineers tried to step forward and say, this plane isn't safe to go to market, but they went ahead anyway. The FAA at the time had moved to a philosophy of self-regulation. So Boeing was being regulated by a unit inside Boeing whose workers were being paid by Boeing. Um, and the government was supporting this all the way. You know, the big shift within this company, which used to be this engineering giant, took place again in the 1980s when the US state engineered a merger between Boeing and this firm, McDonnell Douglas, Douglas which supplied a lot of parts uh, to the US military. And when it engineered this, this merger, Boeing became this organization that was bent on pursuing profits above all else. It denigrated engineering expertise, it lionized senior management, introduced a, a massive cost-cutting agenda that made it a darling of Wall Street, saw its share price go through the roof. And the government supported it all the way because it needed this firm to survive. Boeing was one of the biggest recipients of corporate welfare in the US throughout this period. In fact, in 2018, it was the biggest recipient of corporate welfare. It received massive subsidies from the government. Uh, it received huge tax breaks, and it also received all of these significant government contracts as well. So the idea that this is a free market system, you know, Boeing is one of two massive companies, massive aerospace companies that dominate this market. Uh, and it's not being regulated properly. In fact, it's being supported in all of its aims by the US government. And even after the 737 MAX disasters came to light, even after Boeing was charged with a criminal conspiracy to defraud the United States, it was still given a massive bailout during the COVID-19 pandemic in a bid to support the ongoing existence of this firm. So how are we supposed to hold these organizations to account? If you want an example that's a bit closer to home, some of you may remember the Greensill scandal. Um, so, you know, I've been talking about the kind of support that was provided to working people versus big businesses during the pandemic. Um, this was another great example of how the organs of the state have been used and co-opted to support certain interests over others. Uh, Lex Greensill was an Australian businessman who set up this uh, huge kind of financial institution, Greensill, uh, and it came into some, some trouble during uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. It was a highly unsustainable business anyway. It was built on lots of debt. So naturally, Greensill needed a bailout from the state, as companies often do. Luckily, Greensill had made the uh, exceptionally smart move of appointing David Cameron, our former prime minister, as one of its advisors. So when this uh, scandal broke, sorry, when this, uh, you know, these, these problems with the firm uh, came to light, Greensill sent David Cameron off into Westminster and said, it's your job to get us a government bailout. So what did Cameron do? He started firing off texts to Rishi Sunak, to people all throughout the government, all throughout the Treasury saying, you need to give Greensill a bailout. It's absurd that they're not included in the Bank of England uh, bailout scheme. Um, and at first, he was unsuccessful. Uh, so the Bank of England didn't give Greensill a bailout, but the British Business Bank did. And all of that money, millions and millions of pounds, was lost when Greensill obviously and inevitably went under. It was very easy for someone like Lex Greensill, a big, powerful businessman, to knock on the door of Westminster and say, help me. But if you were a worker, a consumer, an ordinary person who faced eviction, worklessness, homelessness during the pandemic, those same avenues weren't available to you. No wonder people feel so powerless. Now, in vulture capitalism, 
I asked the question, what's the alternative? You know, we can't just rely on corporations to regulate themselves, clearly. That's the kind of neoliberal idea. That's the free market idea. But nor can we just rely on the fact that governments are going to act as a break on corporate power, because a lot of the time, they actually work to reinforce it. We need a third force. So what is that third force? To counterpose the example of Boeing, I look at the example of Lucas Aerospace in the 1980s. Some of you might or might not remember this. Uh, so workers at Lucas Aerospace um, decided when their firm was uh, kind of uh, under threat from international competition, they said, we, right, we need a bailout from the government. So they went to Tony Benn, then Minister of Trade and Industry, and said, can you nationalize us? Because otherwise we're gonna go under and we're all gonna lose our jobs. Tony Benn said, no, we can't do that, but we will support you in developing your own plan to see how you want to run this business. So, you know, the unionists uh, at Lucas Aerospace went back to the workers in their company. Um, and initially, they tried to come up some, with some ideas themselves. They consulted some academics, but nobody was really that interested. So then they took the radical step of just asking all the workers what they think they should do with this company, which primarily at the time manufactured weapons. And the workers came up with this incredible suite of ideas. And all of them were about, right, how do we use the resources that we have to transform this organization from one that produces weapons to one oriented around the production of socially useful technologies? So they developed uh, ideas to use their resources to produce wind turbines, to produce kidney dialysis machines. Uh, they came up with a, a huge array of ideas and a a uh, well thought through business plan as to how to get from here to there, how the workers could actually come to, to govern and manage themselves throughout this process, how they could basically buy out this company and completely reorient it and transform it to create socially useful things and to work in partnership with local government institutions and national government institutions to do that. Then we had the free market turn, right? And this, you know, potentially would have been a good thing for free markets. This would have created a kind of, you know, probably smaller but still very responsive uh, institution that existed within a free market context. But this movement was crushed. Um, and Lucas Aerospace was sold off and cut up into little pieces during the, um, you know, shareholder value revolution of the 1980s. And parts of what was once Lucas Aerospace ended up becoming um, United Technologies in the US, which produced the sensors on the Boeing 737 MAX planes that were faulty, leading to the two crashes that took place in 2019 in which nearly 350 people died. And I thought when I found this out that this was quite an elegant description of the two paths that we faced uh, as a country and have faced as a country and indeed as a planet over the course of the history of capitalism, which is basically a choice not between states and markets, but a choice between an economy dominated by a small number of very powerful individuals who are able to make choices on everyone else's behalf, or a democratic economy in which everyone has input, in which everyone's voices are heard, and is which, which really is the kind of culmination of the democratic movement. And I think the cooperative movement plays a really significant role here. Uh, because the biggest challenge that we face in building a democratic economy, you know, there's lots of, of big barriers to getting to that point and, you know, to the idea of worker ownership and, and the growth of the cooperative movement. But for me, you know, when I go around and talk about all these different things, the biggest thing I come up against is the challenge of individualism. People don't really know what it means to work cooperatively or to be part of a collective movement. Um, we live in this society in which we're encouraged to see ourselves as these isolated, atomized individuals all kind of elbowing each other out of the way to get to the top. Um, and the idea that we might work together to build something for all of us is a bit alien. It doesn't really sit well within this like, competitive individualistic model that we've constructed and that was actually self-consciously constructed in the 1980s. You know, there's no such thing as society. You're not a worker. You're an entrepreneur. Uh, you're not a citizen, you're a consumer of public services. Um, you're not a community, you're a, an individual household. All of that was very self-consciously pushed. You know, the labor movement was broken up, the cooperative movement um, was crushed, local government was crushed, and all of that power was sucked up to the center. What uh, was going on in Lucas Aerospace, the people that were involved in that ended up going to work for the GLC and trying to uh, create this, this democratic movement there. They developed something called the People's Plan for the London Docklands, which was an alternative to what ended up happening with Canary Wharf. But that movement was also crushed when uh, the GLC was crushed. So there was this like, really consistent um, movement against this movement for a democratic economy, basically, and movement for worker power. 
Um, and you still see this today. Um, there's lots of really great examples, you know, in our country of like the community wealth building agenda, for example. This is something that could be really radical. That's all about, uh, you know, orienting local economies around meeting local needs, working with uh, cooperative institutions to uh, use procurement budgets to keep wealth and employment locally. And yet we don't hear about that. You know, nobody's interested. There's very little support that's provided to the councils that are doing these things. There's very little support provided to anything that's going on locally whatsoever. And I think that's why people feel so powerless. It's because we've stopped imagining how we can work together to solve our collective problems. I also think this is at the root of people's um, disillusionment with democracy. Trust in political parties has dropped to its lowest levels ever. It's at 12%. Just 9% of people say they trust politicians, which perhaps isn't surprising, but it's been falling quite significantly over time. And again, I think this comes back to this question of how we build collective movements, how we fight back against individualism. Um, and I think, you know, as my provocation, I don't expect everyone in this room to kind of buy my analysis of capitalism, but the provocation I'd like to leave you with is that the cooperative movement, the growth of the cooperative movement, is going to have to be based on a fight to push back against individualism to encourage people to believe that we can work together to change the way our economy works, to change the way our society works. Um, and a really significant and central part of that is to give people a sense of their own collective power. And rather than saying it's your job to be an obedient worker and do as you're told and sit within this large organizational hierarchy, to actually say, what is your view? What is your voice? And how can you be engaged? in the decisions that are affecting you? How can you engage, be engaged with your community? How can you be engaged in your workplace? I think that is not only the only way to kind of fix this um, highly centralized capitalist economy that we have, I think it's the only way to fight back against the deep and profound disillusionment and powerlessness that most people feel by living in the kind of society that we've created today. And for me, the cooperative movement is a really, really big part of that. Thank you very much. Are we sitting here now? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Told you she was good. We are joined now by Nihal Athanyake from uh, Radio 5, DJ and author of Let's Talk, and Kenyatta Nelson from Cooperative uh, Group. Um, thank you, Grace. As I expected, you've given us a lot to think about uh, to, to open Congress and quite a, a huge challenge, actually. Um, this idea that it's a strategic plan, that our economy is working as is planned and, and strategically set out, I personally wish our governments were that strategically <laughs> good at planning. But however that has happened and however that has come back, my question to you then is do we need a, a, a strategy to combat that? If it's not in the interests of the status quo to distribute power and wealth, have we, have we got any chance of combating that? What, what, do we need a strategy? Absolutely. I think, you know, definitely we all have a chance uh, of doing that. That's kind of why I do the job that I do. It is to give people a sense of their own power in this kind of struggle to build a fairer economy. And actually what I liked most about writing this book was looking into the examples of people and places doing just this. So yes, there's Preston with the community wealth building agenda. I also went to this small village in North Wales called Blyneye Fistiniog, where um, the local community basically came together and started a bunch of little community enterprises. Uh, there was a big um, hydroelectric power plant that was owned by a foreign multinational. So they started their own little community hydroelectric power um, generation schemes. And from there, they used the profits from that to buy up local spaces that they then provided to local businesses, cooperatives, and they became the town with the most community enterprises uh, per capita. Another one that I think is really good and potentially relevant today, um, there's a movement in the US called Cooperation Jackson, and this is in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and it actually emerged from the civil rights movement. So it's mainly um, kind of a black community in Jackson, Mississippi, who have organized um, locally to kind of 
involve themselves in local government and to build a cooperative movement that's based around the principles of, of self-empowerment um, and community organizing uh, and also about kind of using that momentum to then influence politics and they've done that really really successfully by building this kind of local grassroots organization so i think there's loads of examples of people coming together to do the kinds of things that would allow us to really start building this kind of movement um, but again i think the biggest issue that we have is people don't see participation and collective organizing as something for people like them because we live in this individualistic society. Um, so that is, I think, the big challenge. It's how we build movements behind the work that we want to do. So, Nihal, you know, if we need a strategy, if we need a plan, is anyone talking about it? How do we talk? Do people have these conversations? You know, what Grace has said is really quite uh, niche to the UK consumer, but, but really important. You know, do we have these conversations? Well, well where do they come from? what I'd like to start by doing is asking everyone in this room, put your hand up if your mobile phone is on the table in front of you. Put your hand up if your mobile phone is on the table. <laughs> okay. Keep your hand up if you were checking your mobile phone while Grace was speaking. <laughs> Very honest. Yeah. And I like that. I mean, that's, that's like trying to ask someone who farted in the lift, right? Like, <laughs> people don't want to necessarily admit to that. Um, and if we look at individualism, your mobile phone is the beginning of narcissism. You are drawn to it in a way that helps you to ignore the people quite often who are in front of you. How many times have you walked past people having dinner or a bunch of students together? Or in fact, people my age, middle-aged, and they're just staring at their phones. You know, the battle against individualism actually starts with mm. the battle against our own mobile phones and the fact that by simply you having it on the table in front of you, what you were saying to Grace was, was that whatever she was saying was only of equal importance to your mobile phone and therefore you were willing to be interrupted by your mobile phone even though she was giving a keynote speech to you. And that's the same with our children when they're trying to talk to us or it's with our partners when they're trying to talk to us. And what mobile phones do, and they're created to do, specifically with their apps, is to encourage narcissism. It's about likes and shares and follows. It's that dopamine hit of someone saying to us, I see you, but they don't really see you. And the battle against individualism begins there. Don't have your mobile phone on a table in front of you ever. <laughs> Unless, of course, and look, it may be the case that you're waiting for a call from the Qataris, the Egyptians and the Israelis because you're a key part of the peace process in the Middle East. And fine, that's fine. That is what you... And you're just taking a day off in Birmingham Wait, to come my, and... Where's my phone? To, yeah, 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 exactly. Right? My phone's there. Exactly. exactly. Phone's there. But quite frankly, it has encouraged us to stop listening to each other. I wrote a book called Let's Talk, How to Have Better Conversations. But the title of the book could have equally have been Let's Listen How to Have Better Conversations. And the thing that I'm seeing with, and I'm glad to see that no one's heads is now looking down because everyone's <laughs> feeling super paranoid. Uh, that I might go, why are you checking your mobile phone? Um, the reason I wrote it was because people stopped listening to each other. I joined BBC Radio 5 Live in September, sorry, October 2016, the year of the Brexit referendum and a month before President Donald J. Trump became the 45th president of the United States of America. And I think we can all remember that that was a joyous time where there was no division, no rancor, and we were all getting on <laughs> swimmingly with each other, I think. So the reason I wanted to write the book was because we have to start understanding how powerful it is to listen to each other. And organizations like this are quite often fooled into thinking that a conversation is talking. It's actually listening. And organizations talk to people. They want to get their message across. But so rarely, I find, organizations are actually trying to find out the stories of the people that are part of that and listening to them and asking someone, invite me into your space, rather than say, I'm going to tell you about my space. And one thing that I noticed when I was looking across all the social media feeds, across the cooperatives and co-op, was that there didn't seem to be a whole lot of listening, and there certainly wasn't. And this is where the individual is really important, actually, is that 
you use the individual to tell you a story about the organisation, whereas organisations want to tell the individual a story about themselves. And one thing that I found was a slight disconnect when I was looking across this was there are obviously incredible stories about how cooperatives work and how people work together. But what you lead with is the numbers. You lead with 13.5 million people or members, and that's fine. But numbers don't really excite anyone unless they're an accountant, an FCO, or a drug dealer. That's really <laughs> the people that love numbers. Everybody else, it's slightly different. We want stories. I, when I'm asked, what is it that you do, Nihal? I don't say I'm a broadcaster or a podcaster or an author or a semi-retired Radio 1 DJ. I say that I'm in the storytelling business, and that's how we connect. And the problem with saying where the cooperative movement is, it's largely quite a dour thing to say. It's techno language, it's techno speak. It's not about who are you? What do you do? How do I help you? How do you help me? Tell me your story, your town, your village, your school, your family, your business. And that's the one thing that I think is missing. So while quite rightly you think about the individual an individualistic society we live in and the narcissism that comes with that. I think we have to, in the cooperative movement, I say we are not part of it, obviously, um, I cooperate all the time with people. And I love to tell people those stories. Whether I'm interviewing uh, an Israeli mother who lost her son, uh, her eldest child, on the 7th of October, or a Palestinian doctor who was trying to treat people in the horrors of Gaza and the military onslaught that took place, whether I'm interviewing Senator, Senator Bernie Sanders or whether I'm interviewing John Bon Jovi, I'm interested in who you are, not what you do. And a cooperative would be about who you are. Who are these people? Every single one of you have stories that I would be absolutely intrigued to hear about. If you and I sat together for an hour at dinner, we would have the best time. And I tell you this, even though I'm going against it now because I've gone on a boring monologue without even <laughs> breathing for the last five minutes, I would listen far more than I speak. Just, just on that point. Um, Vote Nihal, July the 4th. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Just push you on the ballot. My friend. Um, in the context of how do we do this, what's the plan look like, um, you know, the summer berating that you all just got around <laughs> having your phones on the table. What's interesting for me in listening to this is, I, I don't think this is that difficult okay. because it's inherent in who human beings are, right? As children, we learn to cooperate. It's, 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 it's just who, who we are, it's inbuilt. And interestingly, on the phone point, if you happen to be checking an Instagram or a Facebook, what, why do those things have incredibly high levels of utility? Because they are fundamentally you know, they, 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 they are tangible examples of collectivism, right? You go on Facebook or you go on Instagram and it, it, is, it is loads of people coming together to tell their individual stories. And the reason we get interested in that is because there's more than one person on Instagram. If there was only one person on IG, none of you would go, go visit it. Same for Facebook. There's an interesting element about how we are built as human beings and as people and what we engage and react or respond to that I think is fundamentally connected to the cooperative movement. I, I think the movement, and speaking specifically for the co-op group, we, we lost our way, I think, quite some time ago because I think we, and we're getting back to this place now, there was an element and a time when we stopped focusing on um, our members mm -hmm. and the people that made that organization great and start, start, started focusing more on how do we deliver uh, growth, profitability for the business without understanding, I think, fundamentally those two things are implicitly linked, they're connected. And when you look at cooperatives across the world, particularly those in the Nordics, for example, what you see is a focus on the creation of member value, sustainable member value has le led to the output metrics that are favorable and would be in a, in a capitalist society, but that only happened because they were focused on meeting the needs of the individuals who are members and owners of, of, of those groups. In the absence of that, it becomes a lot challenging, but I, but I don't think it's, it's, it's outside of the realm of possibility for us to, to start leaning into this space and doing more because I genuinely believe, I genuinely believe this, I, I wouldn't say it if I didn't, I genuinely believe this is how humans are built. We're built to be social animals, that's what we are, right? So there's an element of 
reminding ourselves of that and leaning into that space, whether that be personally with our kids, families, and friends, mm. or in our, in our, in our um, a very public lives from a business standpoint. And indeed, it was Darwin that first, you know, pointed that out. That is how humankind develops because of its ability to cooperate. Russell Bertrand, the only yeah. thing that will redeem humankind is cooperation. I think we're all sold in it, but I've got to challenge you, you back, Nihal, because, you know, how... You say it's easy, Kenya, so we're going to get on to, to what you're mm -hmm. going to be about it. I think it's quite a complex story to tell. And when you tell it, it, it as I just did in a Thames Water example, or as Grace just did in many examples, when people understand that co-ops are not the same as other types of businesses that say they've got community, members, ethics, there's something inherently different in the co-op structure, which is this piece around ownership, and the whole constitution of the cooperative is to serve its members, that results in different choices at a board level, different decisions <coughs> being made. And that is not something that you can have a, a, a snatched conversation with somebody or a slogan or a, like that, and you're competing against every business is good, every business is ethical. So I'm challenging back to you because actually, you know, as, as Kenyatta said, somewhere in that our phones are quite useful for telling those uh, stories, whether we're doing it right or not. Um, and, and having those conversations, you know, on a park bench, with our politicians, you know, is something we believe we need to be doing more of. Mm. Um, but how, how do we tell such a complex uh, story? Because it is an important story. And as Grace is saying, we're being told a different story and being told a different representation. How do we combat that? How do we tell that story? Well, um, interestingly, um, Professor Sherry Turkle wrote this brilliant book called Alone Together, which kind of slightly goes against what Kenyatta was saying, which is that we fool ourselves into thinking that social media is a collective. We're alone together. We're largely broadcasting. Um, we're not receiving. Um, in terms of telling complex stories, human beings are complex. We have complex stories. That doesn't make them any less powerful. Complex stories are not made complicated because you use complicated language. The oh, language... we do, we do, we do well, that as well. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. well the, and that's a really interesting point. So when I was uh, on the Board of Governors of the British Council, which is one of the largest, well, it is the largest cultural diplomacy organisation in the world, and as one of the trustees, there was a concerted effort to make sure that our board papers were written in English, were not written in the language of Whitehall, which is ultimately where the British Council received a lot of its funding. And that was a very powerful change in trying to show to the organization that you're human, right? That you understand each other. Really interestingly, the co-op, if you go to their Instagram, um, the co-op, food, shops, their Instagram engagement, 144,000 followers on Instagram, the engagement is pathetic. I mean, it's less than 0.1% on every post, except one, which has 27,000 likes. And what is that? It is Probably a not food. Oh, <laughs> ah, interesting. Or is it, a it is. Animal? It is a sh someone who shops who loved the cheese and jalap jalapeno <laughs> sourdough, right? And posted on social media. Oh, really gutted that you don't have the cheese and jalapeno sourdough anymore. And all Carp did was say, "We listened. It's back," and that went viral because you listened to someone. Yeah. You said to your customer, I hear you and I see you, rather than just telling you of all the things that go up on the co-op food group Instagram, which is there's a discount on this and there's about, and we've got a new pizza and here's some this and here's some that. This was something where I'm not trying to sell you something, I'm listening to you, right? And that's how you tell the stories. My late father said, things are only as complicated as you, as you want to make them. And the problem is when you get into the world of academia or you get into the world of broadcasting even, you try to want to make things complicated because it makes you feel clever, right? And somehow it disassociates yourself from people who you think probably are stupid. Using language is so important. There's a chap that I interviewed for my book and 
He went to America. He's a corporate guy. FTSE 100 chair, incredibly impressive in that world, right? Um, and when he was quite young, he was sent to America to, by a big organization to teach him about conversations in business. And the thing that he was told when he went to that consultancy was, you'll never pick up a hammer. You'll never pick up a screwdriver. The only tools you have are your words. So use them wisely and use them in a way that connects with human beings. So when you say you want complex conversations, do you, do you want to just tell really good stories of complicated humans who are trying through cooperation to make the world a better place? And, and this is very much, you said something very yeah, yeah. brave there, Kenyatta, when you said co-op group, uh, the supermarkets did lose their, 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 their way a little bit over time. And you are yes. actually strategically yes. planning to reset that conversation. I remember two years now you've been, just over two year, years. Three months. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. And uh, it was Shireen, actually, uh, when uh, and Shireen, uh, chief executive of co-op group, came in and really started looking you know, at the organisation and resetting this agenda. And I remember your, it wasn't even your first day, it was way before your first day, and you went up to Toad Lane and you had all, you, yeah. know, you got, come from a background of kind of Procter and Gamble and this great kind of marketing career. And, and like, like, you've taken all of this, absorbed it, and now you want to retell yes. a story to the UK yes. about co-op. So, so what yes. is it you, you, you want yeah. to say? Look, 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 health I, I, think, I, think, I think the... Um, <laughs> The comments around, there's a rubric that I use, seek first to understand before being understood. And I think it's critically important in the African American tradition, my mother would say, you got two ears and one mouth, behave accordingly, right? Mm -hmm. and so I think, I think this piece around making sure that we are listening first and listening, not just hearing. Mm -hmm to react and respond, but listening to understand what, what matters to people, what's important to them. And I think we are, we're, we're, to be fair, we're on this journey now. It's something we, we talk in the business around listen, react, and feedback. But there's a reason why listen is the first word, because we recognize that historically, we ha haven't been great as an organization about hearing what, are, what is important to our members and then reacting to what they've told us in a way that is meaningful. And we're, we're, side. Yeah, we're, exactly. Yeah, and we're seeking to change that. So when we we're looking to relaunch the co-op group in, in in July, and fundamentally we're we're talking about three things. Um, one, what a cooperative is, because we've found, unfortunately, is that across the great British public, there is a lower level of understanding about what a cooperative is, why that's different and then why that difference is meaningful, right? right? So it would be different to say, look, a cooperative is fundamentally a business that is owned by its members. But then you kind of sort of go, what people play back to you when you listen to them is, well, that's, that's, that's great, but what does that mean for me? Um, and then we need to talk them through and walk them through and have a conversation about why that difference is meaningful. So when we go live with this campaign and, and, and genuinely look, it's more than a piece of marketing work. It, it's an attempt I, I hope successfully to reframe the cooperative group and in doing so help to reframe the cooperative movement in a way that's meaningful to the pe people who will hear that message. Um, and it's been, it, look, it's been led by having deep and meaningful conversations with the people we've engaged with. And so hopefully what you will see is a business that walks into the room with a very, very different posture, a very different positioning, and one that is born and comes from this place of we've heard you, we understand what you're looking and seeking from us to deliver to you and want a path to do that. So Grace then, taking uh, you know, what, what, we've, what we've just heard and this idea of you know, individualism and toxic individualism, um, the way that that is presented you know, with something like a national advertising uh, campaign around cooperation, um, do you think, let's say, coming back to this idea of having a strategy and understanding what we're doing, do you think we can tell that story through selling jalapenos? <laughs> Jalapeno cheese sourdough. That does sound really good, to be fair. I would 100% eat that. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think when we're talking about these questions around like individualism and collective power, listening is really important. I think we've established that, definitely. Um, but there is a question about 
the hierarchies of those relationships, right? So who's listening to who? And do they have to actually do anything on that basis? Um, and I think there are different types of listening in that sense. There is the listening that's done by a chief executive who is trying to, you know, rightly support his business, grow his business, etc. Um, and Or hers. Oh, that's true. That's yeah, very true. Mm. <laughs> um, and there is the listening that's done by groups of people organizing together, listening to each other to try and support one another and, and, and make changes on that basis. And when I think about, you know, a business like the co-op, for example, there's so much desire today in the world in which we live for ethical, sustainable, um, you know, democratic businesses. Mm. People will spend loads of money on like a tote bag from a business that claims to be ethical. Most of the time, they're not. You know, we've even got all of this legislation out around the financial sector. You need to focus on environment, sustainability and governance, ESG. Um, and yet, you know, the financial institutions that sponsor fossil fuel companies have high ESG ratings because they're not directly involved in the provision of, of fossil fuels. There's all this whitewashing, greenwashing, um, and it comes from this thing of, oh, we've listened to you, so we're going to change the color of our packaging and make it green and put a leaf on it so that we've shown that we know that you care about sustainability. And then there's the kind of listening that is actually based on an attempt to empower the people that you're trying to listen to. So how are you actually giving people a voice yeah. in your organization? Um, and there's so many interesting ways that you can do that. You know, you can like, as the co-op, survey your members about their priorities and not just their priorities on like, you know, what kind of food's on the shelves, but also what you are investing in as a business. Um, you know, the divestment movement at the moment is huge, and that's been a, a, a movement through which people have had to fight and struggle within organizations like, you know, uh, big universities, big asset managers, to say, we don't want you to be invested in fossil fuels. We don't want our future, our pensions, to be invested in these things. And it's the same thing, I think, that can take place within businesses. You know, I do believe that a business like the co-op can not only just be an ethical and sustainable business, but actually really feed into this narrative about challenging individualism because people feel lonely, disempowered, isolated, and giving them a sense of, you know, the, the, the idea that they could feed into an organization like that, yeah. make their priorities known, and say, I don't want to just buy a sustainable, sustainably sourced piece of tofu. I want to be part of a business in its transition towards sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you guys are in a, a unique position to do that. Just on, just on that point, it's a phenomenal point. And it makes me think of one of the things I think we need in this conversation, which is, which is a bit of bravery, mm. right? This is, I, I, said, I said easy, not easy, simple. It's a better word. Um, but reflecting on my time in the co-op group, and I think about this conversation, we've had discussions, you know, amongst um, our colleagues, our members, our members' council, who, who speak for the some 11,000 members of, we have across the co-op group, and our group board, where we've talked about what it means to go out and speak to members on a going basis, tens of thousands of them, collate what they've said to us and actually act, actually do something about it. When you're running a business in a capitalist society where the rules of the game for Tesco, Sainsbury's and others are the same as yours, right? And you have to grow that business and you're, there's pressure from all angles to do that the bravery required to let go and give control to groups of people who you might look at and go, well, you know, I went to school and I got a degree and I know how to run a business and, you know, that's, that, that, that requires an enormous amount of bravery. And, and it, I think it's one of the reasons why it doesn't happen as often as it possibly should, mm -hmm. because lifting your head above the parapet requires bravery. Mm. And, and, it's, and, it, and it, within, a, within a corporate construct, it can be quite difficult to say, look, we're gonna make a choice because our members and our customers have said this is the right choice for us. How do we know it's gonna pay out? So, fuck if I'm, I don't know, right? So we, but, but, but it's the right thing to do. So we're gonna go off and do it. And I think that's one of the things, particularly here recently, that the co-op group, I can, I can speak for, for our organization, we've really leaned into. But I can tell you there's been conversations where even at a group board, at our board level, you know, uh, People have said, ooh, this is a bit lofty. Are we, are we putting ourselves on a pedestal? We had a long way to fall. 
my point of view is, wh what is the alternative, right? So if we're gonna do this and listen to members and act on what they've said to us and be a different business that makes different choices as a result of how we are owned, then we have to do it. We can't just say it. We have to do it yeah, because our members have, sure. you know, the part, part of listening is not just listening to respond in the context of what we want to say, yeah, so but listening and, 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 and absolutely understanding yeah. and shifting yeah. our perspective and, and, and points of view. But that requires an enormous amount of bravery, I think, and that's an important piece of this discussion. So what we see, so, so co-op group, 11 billion uh, turnover, you know, at the end of the spectrum where, you know, as a trading organization, you're our, you know, uh, highest performing member when we're talking about economic share. And then at the other end of the spectrum, and, and Karen from uh, Birmingham Council touched on it, and, and Grace has touched on it, what we're seeing, as well as our you know, 7,000 co-ops, you know, we've got Tiny Weenie, community co-ops, we've got co-ops growing in tech, so really interesting interesting space for co-ops here in Birmingham, you'll hear about it later. We've got the ownership hub, which is around culture and creativity. So there's all these very different types of businesses across all sectors. And then there's all different types of co-ops. There's worker co-ops, there's consumer co-ops, there's, uh, you know, tenant-based, fan-based, you know. So we've got this real, like, say, complex kind of uh, makeup across the piece. And I think the most depressing thing in uh, your book, actually, was the Lucas plan, because it was, so, um, it was so sad to see such a brilliant plan put together. And you've just touched on it about the bravery of education. And the Lucas plan, from what I understand, fell over because nobody really tried trusted or wanted to trust the workers yeah. and believe that the workers could, could do that. And so I'll bring it back to this general election piece and where we're at now. And I've got Jeevan here sat at the front from Save Our City in Birmingham. He's got a lot of residents who are angry about the assets of Birmingham being mm. taken over for property. He's got all these people ready to go. Um, so, but there's some sort of mismatch. I've been coming back to this idea, and I'll come back to you, Nihal, on, on, on how we might have these conversations. But there's some, there's some sort of mismatch about, like you said, people want democratic control. People want this new way of doing things. But you take some of our co-ops here, and they will tell you how difficult it is to take a great little uh, pilot and um, equal care copy we heard from mm -hmm. last year, brilliant social care uh, co-op, scaling that, yeah. taking over that, taking over our national services uh, potentially. So I'm going to come back to because I'm just, I'm only looking at my phone because I can't see the clock by the way. She's checking her Facebook. <laughs> Um, but that's what I want to come back to, like how, like, how do we strategically plan these conversations? And then I'll be coming to you, uh, Nihal, for, for, for some uh, greater understanding. And I'm still going to come back to, I'm not, uh, we, we, we're here to get ideas from yeah. you experts, yeah. I think um, people often talk about this idea of like, oh, this was successful, how do you scale it up? I remember when I went to this village in Wales to talk to, to the community there, um, and, you know, after I wrote this article and, and academics had kind of studied it and stuff, there was all of this interest and people coming down from the Senedd to say, how do we scale it up? How do we make this happen in all these other places? And the people who had do, done the community organizing were kind of like, well, this is our community. Like, we built this here. We, you know, you can support people to do it elsewhere, but we're not going to go build this somewhere else. And I think that's the point, isn't it? It's the, um, often when you're sat in this place of kind of, you know, strategic management and coordination, you think, right, that worked there, so let's pick it up and do it again there. Um, and I think that is kind of, it kind of contravenes the spirit of what we're talking about when we're talking about real democracy and real engagement. Because what you want to do is empower people to do their thing in their place. There's a really example, actually, of a Brazilian manufacturing firm that did exactly this. So rather than having centralized control in the central plan, they, uh, the, the CEO split up the business into basic groups of small teams and said, go and come up with ideas as to what to do with the business and then trial them on a small basis and then we'll see what works and we can scale it up if it does work. And that is, again, brave because you're ceding control to people who you maybe think, why should they have any expertise? Why should they have any knowledge? Why should I trust them? Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, that question about scale is really a question about, you know, we're talking about councils and, uh, and government is a question of subsidiarity. It's about allowing power to be held at the lowest level that is you know, both um, efficient and also um, you know, effective. So if power can be held locally, if people can be able to make decisions at a scale that works for them and then trial things and then feed back up to the top and you know, coordinate that way, then that is 
often a better way of organizing it. It creates more resilient businesses, creates more resilient societies because you have this diversity, which is a key principle. You know, we were talking about evolution and the development of cooperation, that principle of diversity and allowing people to adapt to their situations, to use their expertise, to adapt to the challenges that they have is I think really important. And it's really common, again, you're, you're uh, speaking to the converted a lot in this room, but we see that a lot, you know, uh, Unicorn Co-op, one of our members in Manchester, amazing um, uh, grocery organisation, that time and time and time again, they're asked to go and do it elsewhere. And they're like, no, we, yeah. but we'll show you how. Yeah. Here you go, Carbon mm. Co-op's another great one who's shown loco uh, homes in, in Edinburgh how to do it. So it's not about necessarily scaling up the business, it's scaling up the idea. You know, that, that's what we need. And so, so why I'm coming back to Unihal is um, when, you, uh, when, you, when, when you look at the benefits that cooperative business bring to the UK, you start getting uh, the more resilient. You were five times less mm. likely to go under in mm. the pandemic. You've got, particularly in worker and employee-owned, um, greater productivity. You know, when people have a say can, uh, stake and a say, you know, naturally, uh, you get uh, better performance. Um, that um, well-being, you know, co-op group would have been the first uh, in, in many areas of, of ethics. Co-op group have been like UK leading most uh, for workers first menopause uh, policy. You know, example, example, example. So, so you kind of got all this. It is, it is better for our society mm. if all uh, businesses were cooperatives or worked cooperatively together. And like you say, you said you're not part of, uh, of the movement. You probably are a member of a co-op somewhere, and this will get on to the next panel. You probably don't even know you're a member of a co-op is, is, is part of the challenge. Well, I'm a dad, so I'm a, I'm a <laughs> yeah. And you're an of, artist. Uh, uh, you're an co -op artist. Of yeah, you know what, you know, DJs and artists, collectives, you know, people yeah, working yeah. together. It's, it, yeah. no. So it's about scaling up that conversation. So let's say we've got complex, um, kind of across all sectors, all these different types. But what we're trying to get to the nub of here in these conversations is if that you if you have uh, you know more businesses that are owned and controlled by the members you do get better outcomes for uh, society and in your context of, of listing and, and let's say Kenyatta I know listens because every other Saturday it feels like the National Member Council a co-op group are all gathered uh, together to, to do those uh, listening uh, pieces but I'm going to come back to like, how do we tell the story? You know, how, how do we have that conversation? How do we tell that story well, in a way that people get behind the idea? And I'll finish it. Get behind the idea of right now in the UK, something goes wrong with the business. Thomas Cook, great example. And the conversation will be, should we nationalise it? Mm. Or should we privatise it? Mm. And what we need the conversation to be is, or actually could we all work together and fight? And it's never in the conversation. So what I'm saying is how do we get in the conversation? How do we scale up the idea of cooperation? So um, not that long ago, I had a long conversation with James Timpson, who you might know runs Timpsons, yeah. right? He's an extraordinary guy. 4,000 employees. Debbie, you'll know all about uh, James Timpson. He probably lived very close to you, actually. Um, and um, he has 4,000 employees. 10% of whom have been to prison, or as he calls it, have prison experience, which he feels is vital for his business. He came on, and we had this conversation, and he could have told me all about the numbers of his business. Could have told me all about stores, and they're making this profit and that, but he didn't. He told me about the people. He told me about, and he knew to granular detail, people that worked in Timpson stores. He knew their name, he knew how many kids they had. It was brilliant. And he, that's because he put himself into their space. He'd ask them to invite them in. And also, as well, of course, he doesn't call any of them staff. He calls everyone colleagues. That's what he says, which is exactly what a cooperative is. I go back to this again, is that throughout all of this, I've heard about the macro, but not the micro. And the micro are the people. I haven't heard a name said. I haven't heard a particular name of a family. And interesting, when Grace said, um, you know, put those stories up to the bosses. No, let the bosses come down, as it were. And you usually be up and down, come sideways mm -hmm. to try and go into their space rather than waiting as a boss to say, 
come and tell us your stories. No, go and find out their stories. If you're leaders of businesses, you must be willing to say to the people, we want to be part of your life. And that's what James Timpson does. He tours, he's on the road all the time, going to find, no, okay, that's 4,000, not 13.5 million, right? So it's difficult to do that. But certainly in your areas, to try and understand from each other what a cooperative really means. And a cooperative is a group of humans. And rather than asking about how your cooperative is doing, ask them how your children are doing. How's, where did you go on holiday last year? Find out these basics to allow you. You've got to go further upstream, I think, than you're willing to go at the moment. I think that there's this kind of disconnect in some ways, uh, is what I'm sensing. I may be wrong because I'm very new to this conversation, but looking across the social media, even hearing Kenyatta is definitely on that journey to get the organisation to come closer to understanding the human beings that make up a cooperative, yeah. Yeah. rather than losing the individual. Because yes, the individualism is there, but what you don't want to do is lose the individual in the cooperative. And I think you may be in danger of doing that, and hence why potentially there is not that connection with people like me who had to look far and wide to try and work out what a cooperative was, right? And what it meant. And look, you know, I'm a fairly well-read guy. I think I should know a little bit more about it than I probably did. And that, that's the crux of the, the, the issue, absolutely. Right, yeah. So, Kenyatta then, uh, membership worth owning. Yes. You know, what, is that correct statement? Because uh, I could be a member of uh, the AA. <laughs> and get benefits and discounts and yes, services, yes, yes, don't own it. Yes. Does it matter? Yeah, I think, I think it absolutely matters. So, so look, one of the conversations we have in the business all the time, um, particularly as we are kicking off this work, was around how do we get, um, how do we do a better job of telling the story as, as storytellers? How do we do a better job of telling the story of what a cooperative is and why it's different? And the second question of those two, in our view, is critically important. And it's different because it's member owned. So you can be a member of lots of things, loyalty programs, points, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, the question is, do those organizations listen to you? And is that listening performative or not? And, and, and two, um, what does that membership really mean? And we are of the view that because we are a cooperative business, that membership is meaningful. And it's meaningful not just because we engage and we listen to our members collectively and individually, but also we are about the business of creating value for them, real value and tangible and sustainable value. And yes, some of it is economic, for sure, because we exist in a highly competitive marketplace and we need to do that. But there are other elements of this which are connected to social value creation, which is the value we create for local communities and communities at large collectively and together. Um, and there's also the value that comes with owning a successful cooperative business. And that is fundamentally rooted in making sure that you as an owner of the business understand that one, you are part owner. Two, what that means is you have a say in how this business is run. And that's a real thing. It's not, it's not something that we've made up. It's in the Constitution. It's part of the values of the organization. What we, gotta, we have to do a better job of is, one, telling that story, and two, making that proof point tangible and real. Because lots of people can say it. The question becomes, what are we doing within the organization to bring that to life in a really meaningful way for our colleagues, for our members across the UK and beyond? I fundamentally believe, and I've seen it, co-ops across Europe in particular who have done this and done this well have succeeded. Um, in, in, in massive ways, not just commercially, but also from the standpoint of what they're able to create for the members in the society at large in countries like um, Sweden, Norway, and others. We're on that journey. We're at the beginning of that. Others much further ahead than we are, but we have a blueprint. It's clear, right? And, and a lot of it comes down to what we've talked about today around listening and engaging and moving, moving uh, decision-making to where insight is rather than insight up to where decision making sits. And so, but, but again, that requires a lot of bravery. bravery. Mm -hmm. And so we are on that journey. Um, I'm, I'm quite heartened, it's one of the reasons why I came to this business. I'm quite heartened by the fact that the business, the board, our colleagues, our members, our, our group board, we're all, we're all on this boat. 
there's not a single one of us who is not. Membership is a member ownership is a central tenet to our strategy as a business. And we are focused on uh, making sure we have the right conversations and making sure those conversations lead to real and tangible uh, value creation for the members that we serve. Thank you. Right, before we go to a, a break then, uh, final thoughts, ownership worth, uh, membership worth owning and, and conversations worth uh, having. Uh, any takeaways, uh, Grace, for us to be thinking about at Congress? Yeah, I mean, it's been so interesting hearing um, from you guys today. And I guess moving forward and into the next sessions, my takeaway would be to always be asking these questions about where power is held um, and uh, whether or not that power is accountable um, and how to create relationships that are based on mutual accountability, um, listening and cooperation rather than hierarchy and kind of domination, I suppose, which is what is too often present in most businesses and doesn't have to be the case with cooperative movement. But all cops here hold that mirror up to themselves and, and, and ask that mm. question. Can you add to anything you want anyone yeah, to Yeah, three, three things. I would encourage all of us, including myself, um, to, to engage meaningfully with our customers, our colleagues, our members, and make sure we're listening first to understand before being understood, number one. Number two, um, take what we've heard and act on it in an authentic and meaningful way to create value for the members of our organizations. And lastly, be, be brave, because the first two things are simple to do, uh, but sometimes not the easiest thing to action, particularly in the context of a commercial enterprise. And so that's what I would call out. Thank you, and you have? Give yourself a break from your phones. <laughs> Let's do that. And then you'll be present and in the moment. And the people sitting opposite you will feel seen and you will feel seen, as opposed to feeling liked or shared. <laughs> thank you, you very much. And thank you to an amazing panel.